The most important thing is that our God is good. And all the time. Amen. Our God is good. And all the time. Amen. No matter what we're going through, no matter what we're facing, nothing is too challenging and nothing is too difficult for God. I heard a, I heard a testimony, actually not a, um, on a Christian uh, channel nowhere, but on a secular news media where one lady, she lost her daughter in a, in a war zone, actually in Sudan, and they told her her daughter was shot and her daughter died along with her sister. And so she immigrated to the United States as an immigrant and, you know, moved on and, and lived here for over 24 years. And so while living here, she grew older a little bit and um, people told her that there is such a thing as Facebook. I know none of you know what that is, but she discovered Facebook for the first time. And some of you were shocked that our pastor was on Facebook yesterday. And so uh, I got a lot of messages. <laughs> People are saying, what is going on? And pastor wants to be my friend. They did not know that I was adding them for you. So it's me who wanted to be your friend in the name of our pastor. Anyway, so she went on Facebook. is trying to, you know, catch up with the technology in her days. And next thing that happened is that on Facebook, there is this friend request where it's a virtual friend request where people want to be friends with you virtually. It's not in real life. They're not actually your friends, but in virtually. And one lady knocked on her wall wanting to be a friend and she looked at her and she realized something very similar about her facial and um, she looked at her name name did not seem familiar to her and anything and then after many days and many weeks she just had this nudge like sandra said something came to her head to to write to this person her friend on facebook to just find out who she's from and everywhere and as they started to write she turns out that this girl is 25 years old looking for a mother and this mother who thinks her daughter is dead is talking to her daughter who is not dead but who survived and her sister who thinks she's dead is actually raising her up and in few weeks to her greatest surprise, she gets, you know, she wins this uh, ability to come to the United States on a refugee visa, ends up in the same city. She meets her at the airport 20 year, 24 years later, thinking her daughter is dead. She meets her for the first time. And they show on the news media, their family get together and they sing about Jesus and everything, Sudanese. I mean, Sudanese people, they're awesome. Can somebody say amen, Sandra? right and so this is honestly our God can do anything amen and so he can raise the dead or sometimes he can bring them back to life in our own memory when we think they're gone amen, amen. nothing is impossible to our God in Jesus name amen I'm just gonna read the verse right now if you have your Bible with me go to Exodus chapter 3 verse 10 and we have Bibles for those of you who don't have it on your tablets or on your phones right behind you um, Exodus chapter 3 verse 10 as you go in there we want to let you know that we have a Friday night prayer this Friday unfortunately I will be gone this Friday night we will be in Seattle speaking at uh, one church conference just for Friday we'll be back for Saturday and for uh, for Sunday service and so uh, pray for us that God will give us the grace and the power to minister his word over there Exodus chapter 3 verse 10 and verse 12 Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And verse 12. And he said, God said, I will certainly be with you, and this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Everybody say, this mountain. The title of my message will be called the effects of exposure the effects of exposure and we will take this story as a background as our proof text to talk about the power of exposure many countries understand the power of exposure in some countries actually they're not allowed to use internet or in some they filter internet they filter everything because people are afraid in the government that if the nation gets an exposure to their things to the information outside of our regime that they will rebel against our regime and break down our regime that's one of the reasons why the, the protest in Egypt were so successful was because people had an access and people had an exposure to the world outside and in this way they received encouragement and actually organizationally the protest in Egypt were online. Not 
on their streets they were first online they organized a group on Facebook and that's how everything lifted off and so exposure has a very big power I was born in the same year where in April in my country not very far from where I lived there there's this nuclear thing exploded and most of you know it now it's called Chernobyl it's in the same year that I was born about 27 years ago and the exposure when people got exposed to the radiation many people died instantly but many more people died gradually because the exposed things that they were exposed to started to affect their health and deteriorate their well-being because of exposure it's something you couldn't see with your physical eyes but it's something you can sense and because you got exposed to it you were affected some of you also know how world war ii ended when united states dropped an atomic bomb on the territory of Japan and the two very powerful cities of Japan and actually if you read the the story you don't see many people dying when the bomb fell it was an immediate reaction more people died later but they were exposed right away to the radiation and because they were exposed to radiation it destroyed their health in the long term and therefore it brought a World War II to an end there is a power in exposure when you grow up in a ghetto and you have an exposure to something bigger than your surrounding your life can change or when you grow up in a good family but you constantly have an exposure to something negative or radiation your life can take a different route and a different you, your direction can be altered because of the things that you're exposed to exposure has very big effects can somebody say amen we're talking about a man named Moses we have a vision in our church and the vision is to see the whole gospel come to our whole city the gospel to be brought to our city and to our region and today we want to speak that will help everything we do in our church from testimonies to worship they're all to help us with our vision that is to bring the whole gospel to the whole city the whole gospel means not just that Jesus is born out of Virgin Mary but that he is the son of God he's the healer he's the savior he's the deliverer and he hates the devil and he defeated him on the cross amen that is the whole gospel and there's a lot more facets to it that I'm not going to mention right now but I could mention during the service Moses is the man who spent 40 years in the in Egypt because he made a mistake of killing a man very bad mistake actually it caused him to run for his life in the wilderness and he spent about 40 years in the wilderness he married a woman there had some children and he had hired he got hired as a shepherd means he took care of the sheep for his father-in-law he lived with his in-laws and those of you who have in-laws you know that that is not a greatest recipe for success in marriage but he therefore had 40 years of living with his in-laws he did not die they did not die he didn't commit suicide they survived it was it was a miracle in itself and he was a shepherd working for them it was a crazy story and one day the bible says as he was taking his sheep on the ordinary deal during the day he walked by and he sees a fire in the bush for a shepherd to see a fire in the desert is a threat to your business because if you see fire in a desert you know one thing about fire is fire spreads really fast where it's dry so the fact that you are shepherding your sheep and you're seeing fire in the desert you're seeing something that is a threat to what you're doing and if this would have been you or I most likely we would go and call firefighters we would grab some water and without thinking try to go put out the fire because this fire could destroy your business but the Bible says Moses doesn't ignore the fire Moses doesn't go on with his business and doing what he was doing before he saw the fire Moses stops and he turns aside and he says I will go and see what is this interesting thing that I'm seeing that doesn't burn out and as he turned to see God spoke Moses saw the fire in the bush and he didn't just go on but he was aware of the activity of God around him and he paused and was curious enough to go and see what it was about and as he did so God showed himself up and started to speak to Moses I want us to know one very interesting thing if we want God to use us we must become curious and aware of his activity around us 
We must become hungry for what God is doing around us. We must become interested in the bushes God chooses to kindle with His flame. And sometimes those bushes have nothing to do with what you're doing. You got your own business, you have your own schedule, you need to bring your sheep to the well, you need to bring them back to the fold. You have no time to observe some fire in some bush. But if you want God to speak, you must be curious to see what He is doing. Before Moses heard God, Moses saw what God was doing. I remember when last year we came to Ukraine and we came to Ukraine because not because to see the protests in Ukraine. Those things are good, but they're not what was interesting to us. What was interesting to us is in Ukraine, there is a bush that has a fire inside. And this bush has become very known because a lot of people started to talk about this bush. When I say bush, I mean actually there is a ministry in Ukraine that God is using in a very extraordinary way. And we heard about that ministry. There's a lot of criticism about that ministry. And there's a lot of uh, haters who are hating and just saying all kinds of things against that. And I remember me and my wife, we, we went to Ukraine and my cousins whom I love dearly, one particular cousin who is a worship leader in his church along with his wife, has a very beautiful home, very nice Mercedes, beautiful child, wonderful wife, good life. And he is hungry for revival. When I met with him, you know, I am on a mission in Ukraine. I want to go see the bush. I want to see this thing that everybody's talking about that I saw on TV that God is doing something. I want to go see what God is doing there. I heard so much criticism, but I want to go see for myself. So I see my cousin and I'm thinking, you know, I don't know Kyiv very well, which is the capital of Ukraine. He knows Kyiv very well. So I'm trying to see if he has the same curiosity inside of him to see the bush as I am. So I ask him, like, you know, so how are things happening in the church? He's like, Vlad, things are so difficult in the church. People are not getting saved. People are not getting healed. Demons are not being expelled. We don't even believe they're demons no more. He said, things are so difficult, so challenging. So I'm like, yes, it's going to be so easy to convince him that there's a fire and that we have to go see the fire because he's hungry, I'm hungry, both too hungry. So I'm like, since things are so challenging and difficult and dead and cold, there is this thing that God is doing in Ukraine. I saw it all the way in America through a satellite and I think you know about it too. Let's go check it out. He said, oh, no, 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 brother Vladimir, that's not for me. That's not for us. I said, what do you mean it's not for you? He says, did you hear what they say about him? I said, where, in the Bible? He said, no, on the news. I said, I heard some things, but they said Jesus didn't rise from the dead and his disciples stole the body too. I'm like, I don't believe the Christianity, everything about Christianity, if we would believe what the news said as though what the news said is inspired by God, we would never be a Christians. I'm like, you can't believe everything the news says. Come on, you're a Christian. You're better than that. He says, but still, you don't know these people. I said, let's go find them out. <laughs> he said, oh no, this is a dangerous place. When you step into it, you, you do not know what's going to happen. And so my friend, who's my cousin, whom I still love, he decided not to take a risk and he decided to leave the fire alone and went back into his city. I stayed there for three, three more days. We went and we, we came close to that fire. We got our chance to stick our hands into it. It was very warm. It was very good. I got so challenged. I got so blessed. I got encouraged. Honestly, I came back home. Something good happened to me. We went back to Ukraine three months later, which was two weeks ago. We met with the same cousin. And I said, so did anything change in the past three months? He said, lad, nothing. I said, I felt like everything changed with me. And I know it's an exaggeration. I know it's just, but I'm like, and I'm back to see the same fire. I said, do you want to come along? Oh, I don't have time. This is, I'm like, it's in your backyard. For God's sake, you have time. Everything you're dreaming of, this fire is in your backyard. Everything you're wanting is here. You don't have to go jump into it. Just go put your hands at least to see if it's real or not. Well, my spirit is not suggesting me. Now, it's very, it'll be very difficult for a spirit to suggest to you right things if you're reading about something that is not from the spirit. The spirit spoke to Moses only when Moses stopped and came close to the fire now when Moses turned his back toward it how can a spirit speak to you when you don't go see it for what it is instead of you read some news of people who just want to put out fires 
Can somebody say amen? If we want to have activity of God in our church, we must be very cautious and very interested in God's activity around our lives. Any bush God chooses to set on fire, I want to be around it. Now, if that bush might not be your size, you prefer apple trees, great. But if God likes a bush, you have to go to the bush. Not for the bush's sake. Don't get me wrong. Bushes, that's just a tree. But if there is a fire that doesn't stop in that bush, it has to grab your attention. It has to whetten your appetite. Can somebody say amen? See, the, the church, we as Christians have this tendency historically, when a, God's, when a fire starts around us, instead of going to it, we have a tendency of calling fire trucks. Christianity has a tendency of putting out fires. Christianity has a tendency, a religion has a tendency to see the fire around us as a threat to what we're doing. Many people feel like a revival in a city is a threat to every church. The only people who should be threatened by revival is the devil, darkness, and demons. When we feel threatened by revival happening in a church across the street, we have to ask a question, are we on the right side? Since when did revival become a threat to you? Revival is not our threat. Revival is our desire. And even if that revival doesn't happen here and it happens there, we'll be like Moses, leave the sheep right here. Say, sheep, you wait right here. Let me go see it and I'll bring it back to you. Moses did not wait for the sheep to go see the fire. Moses says, sheep, you wait and the shepherd is going to go see the fire. Not to put it out, but so that I can see what the fire can do for me. We are experts at putting out fires. A Christianity, we see a religion constantly fights against fires that God starts. And this always happened. It didn't happen just with Jesus. It started way, 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 way earlier when God touched Abel and put fire on Abel's life. Cain could not come to Abel and says, hmm, let me warm my hands around it. He brought a fire extinguisher and he killed Cain. He killed Abel because it's always easier to put out the fire. But you have to understand, you can kill the bush, you can never kill the fire. He killed Cain, but he could not kill God's favor on his life. Because it jumped to another generation named Seth. God's fire can never be put out. You can kill a man, you can kill a movement. They put Christians into the lion's dens, but they could never kill Christianity. They crucify them upside down. Nero put them in the garden and light them as torches for entertainment. And they, they said that Christianity would be completely wiped out. Now, you can wipe out Christians, but you will never wipe out Christianity. You can destroy the bush, but you can never destroy the fire inside of the bush. Why? Because that's what, this, that's what it says here, the fire that was not burning out. We are a church that are attracted and curious and hungry for God's activity around our life. And don't get me wrong, we don't worship trees. We worship the one who puts his fire in them. Can somebody say amen? amen. Moses paused, stopped. He says, I want to see. What is this going on? I want to I just see it for myself. I'm surprised sometimes with some of the friends that I have who read things about Prophet T.B. Joshua online. And who have come to the elevation where they took, put Google and the Holy Scriptures on the same level. I'm shocked with how they will read things on internet and take things on internet as an inspired God breathed Word of God. And I said, if those things, they said, you went to the Scoan. I said, I went to the Scoan not because I've never read what people said. But I'm just not a fool. I know that my Christianity has always had critics. And news has never been positive about Christianity. Never. Never. Throughout the history, news has never been positive about the life, vibrant Christianity. And I am a Christian not because I believe the news. I don't ignore the news, but I want to see it for myself. And when you go see it for yourself, and then you make your decisions, and then you make your conclusions. Amen. Moses seizes the fire. He comes to it. He doesn't want to put the fire out, and he doesn't want to avoid or ignore or avoid the fire. He comes to it, and something happens. The voice comes from the fire, and the voice calls him in and says, come. It's interesting that before God said go, God said come. Our vision is go, but the power is in come. 
our vision is the great commission go into all the world but the power for that vision is in the great commandment love the lord your god with all your heart all your soul and all your might we must understand that the vision has to marry the devotion we must understand the go must be united with the come God doesn't send us to go if he doesn't invite us first to come God wants to invite us first to himself before he sends us to represent himself our mission as a church of Jesus Christ is to make God known but our assignment is to know him because we can't make someone known whom we don't know we can't have a successful great commission if we are poor at fulfilling a great command you cannot have a great compassion for the lost if you don't have a great passion for the one who searches them out and that's where God brings Moses he says Moses come before he tells him go God invites us our mission as a church is to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature it's a privilege to do that you must understand we are not meant to do life alone it's fascinating when satan fell from heaven he didn't fall alone he took his friends with him a lot of people actually when you see eve sinning eve didn't just eat sin like many people sin today you know they just hit it nobody knows about it no eve invited the only human that was alive adam and says adam i sinned and so will you join the club it's fascinating that it's a human tendency to sin in a group the statistic says that on average a person who smokes weed will introduce 13 other people to weed every single year and i have not found one school class or seminary where potheads are encouraged to spread the gospel of weed you know how they spread weed they get high and when you get high and you like it then you go and you get other people high that's exactly what they can there is there is no teaching what people do is they simply try it and only then they sell it nobody pays them they do it why because they did it on their own now weed is not the gospel weed is that's the stuff that destroys people but but the gospel when you try it first when it touches your life and then you go and you spread it for the glory of God when you see Jesus casting out demons and the demons constantly demons are the best evangelists demons were so demons were the first people to recognize Jesus was God it's kind of sad when people with theology people with God experience people with the Bible people with Torah couldn't see who Jesus was and they thought he was blasphemy and these wicked poor demons screaming he is the son of God and Jesus never allowed them to tell people who he was I think I know why because the privilege to tell who Jesus is is not belonging to demons it belongs to God's children God does not want demons to tell who he is God wants you and I to tell who he is God says this is a precious gospel and I don't want these pigs these swine these demons these evil creatures who are going to hell to tell about my gospel this gospel is going to be preached by those who've been redeemed sanctified and whose lives been completely changed by it can somebody say hallelujah and so come go our vision in our church is not just to preach the gospel but also to spend time with Holy Spirit come and if we want to be effective in bringing people to Jesus we have to become more effective in bringing ourselves to him where we spend time with him so that we can represent him accurately to our generation can somebody say amen amen, amen. Now we see that as, as we keep going a little bit further, we see that God tells Moses, the verse that we read in verse 12, chapter 3 of Exodus, God tells Moses, this is the sign that I'm going to give you. He said, the sign that I am sending you and the sign that I am going to be with you and you are going to be the right man for the job is this. You are going to go back to Egypt and the people from Egypt you are going to bring to the promised land. But before the promised land, this is going to be the sign. You are going to bring these people to the same place that you are in right now. 
and so Moses leaves this place you know he has few miracles under his under his belt he encountered God his life was forever changed he comes to Egypt and I can imagine Moses gets up you know and you have to make an introduction and give yourself a little prop a little history of who you are I am Moses this is what I was born this is when I fled and I met this God God of Abraham who has been completely silent for the past hundreds of years nobody has heard about him what's happening to him where he's at did he take a vacation did he leave where is he I heard him he spoke to me in the bush in the fire I know his name I know what he told me these are the miracles these are the proof and I can imagine see all of these people watching and they're saying oh my goodness this is so incredible and there were these few revivalists probably in that meeting who said I want to be like Moses I wonder if I can kill a person go to the desert marry a woman shepherd the flock and meet God in the same way I wonder what can I do so God can show himself to me like he did to Moses I wonder if some people actually went to fast and pray so God can reveal himself to them like he did to Moses because I know that's what happens to us when we hear somebody has a crazy encounter with God right we all want to have exactly same thing you guys this is the amazing part is God tells Moses I want you to go to Egypt and I don't want you to elevate yourself as a superhero I don't want you to simply come and tell them that you are something super special I want you to bring them to exactly same place where I met you I went into the bush to reveal myself to you but I will hit a mountain to reveal myself to a nation see this whole thing that I'm doing to you Moses yes it's because you're special yes because it's I love you but actually you're the first fruit of what I want to do for the whole nation and the sign is that you are genuine and legit is when the whole nation is going to experience what you are experiencing right here right now it's interesting that it took Moses 40 years to come to that encounter but when he led the nation it took him less than 40 days to come to the exactly same encounter where they saw God in the fire to fill the whole mountain Moses stumbled upon a great encounter with God but the nation was led to it because Moses was not sent as a hero he was sent as a guide every person who has a great encounter with God every person who reaches a great success in life must understand his assignment in this world and his assignment is this is not to elevate yourself on a pedestal as a high and mighty but to elevate yourself as a leader who will lead people from their situation into the place where you had your change and your encounter so people can experience the same can somebody say amen my friends I want to tell you something today God wants us to experience him the same way Moses did that's one of the reasons when the Ark of the Covenant was built it was not built in Moses's tent it was built in the center of Israel because God did not just want to be the God of Moses he wanted to be the God of Israel that's why when God sent manna he did not send manna into Moses's mailbox he sent manna for every single person in Israel because he wanted to be everyone's God not just one man's God but he reveals himself first to one man so that that man will take a whole nation and bring the whole nation to the same place he met God one on one so for Israel if they want to meet God the same way Moses did the goal is not to go to the desert the goal is to follow Moses when they would follow Moses they will meet the God who met Moses if you read the encounters that men of God had for example like Pastor Benihin an encounter the encounter that he had with the Holy Spirit he had a very supernatural and a very unique encounter with the Holy Spirit and you must understand that not many people in the world and in the history will have an encounter like that on their own God gave that encounter to Pastor Benny Hinn not just so that Benny Hinn will have an international ministry but so that Benny Hinn will be your Moses who will lead you into the same encounter as you read and follow his ministry 
And that's why Claudio Frazier and Vladimir Montan and many other ministers, after following the exactly same thing that Pastor Benny wrote in his book, had exactly the same encounter with Holy Spirit and some of them do actually greater miracles in their ministries than Pastor Benny Hinn. The sign that this is legit is when Jesus says, what I do will work for you too. And disciples did exactly the same thing that Jesus did. That is the sign this is legit. This all doesn't only apply to spiritual things, this applies to natural things. Some of you, you know, know the ministry of marriage today. But Jimmy and Karen Evans, which are marriage counselors and they're pastors of a very large 10,000 member church today. When they were married, Jimmy and Karen, uh, they were married and he, he was not a Christian and they had a lot of troubles and a lot of problems, a lot of issues, a lot of unfaithfulness and their marriage went through hell. And he survived, literally survived supernaturally, how God dealt with him, how God healed him, delivered him and his wife and a lot of things happened. And somehow on accident, they started to lead marriage classes in their church. It grew to just few couples coming to them for help and next thing that happened they started to help other couples experience what they have experienced. It grew to something where they started the church and now they have a worldwide international ministry and everybody knows them not by their church but by their men marriage ministry and marriages are healed every single day why because God didn't just heal their marriage so they can sell a book God didn't heal their marriage so they can become an example but God healed their marriage so they can be a guide to take your marriage from point A to point B same thing happened with Dave Ramsey as you know how he was a multi-millionaire he went to zero and how he recovered and today he takes other people from point A to point B the real sign of some things of something that's consistent and genuine is when it can be duplicated. If it cannot be duplicated, if it's just you are so special and you cannot bring nobody to exactly the same place that what you've done, then honestly nobody really needs it. Because then you become a God Almighty powerful superhero but you're not a guide. You cannot lead nobody. You can only have people adore you. And Moses was not somebody they adored. Moses was somebody they led, they followed. Because Moses was able to lead. Can somebody say amen? amen. And instead of cl closing yourself in the room, they, the only thing they had to do is follow Moses. And as they followed Moses, they reached to the same mountain that Moses reached. Now Moses stands there. Prior to this, Moses had an exposure. Moses had an exposure to the palace. The first exposure Moses had in his life was to the palace. And this exposure brought pride. Anytime we only get exposed to the palace, to the palace meaning to the good things, great things, powerful things, opportunities. If the only thing we get exposed in life is to the palace, it breeds pride. And pride is something that is very dangerous because it eventually destroys us. The court of Pharaoh, they were infected with this leprosy and this disease called pride. They're only exposed to their court and they're only exposed to their realm which everything is good and they never allow themselves to be exposed to the pain of people in their own nation. They're only exposed to the pleasure of the court and they are infected with pride. When God came and told them to release the slaves they made a fuss about it. They made a big deal about it and everything about them was prideful. When you are only exposed to the pleasures and the good things in life, something will creep in if you don't protect your heart closely is pride will creep in. And what pride will do is will do same thing to you what it did to the palace. It will bankrupt it, corrupt it and bring the plague of God. Pride is very dangerous. It was not found on earth first, it was first discovered in heaven. And the humans did, were not diagnosed with it first. It was first an angel was infected with it. This archangel was actually one of the most beautiful angels in heaven. And when he had pride in him, it turned him from an angel to the devil. Remember, Satan didn't want to be Satan. He wanted to be God. Became Satan. When you allow pride, pride what it does, it turns an angel into a demon. And humility will turn a demon into an angel. Now not the devil's demon, but people who become like demons, evil and inside, it could turn our life. Moses was exposed to the palace. For the next 40 years, Moses gets exposed to the pain. Because the Bible says we know that Moses decides to go 
and get exposed to something else. He wants to expose himself to the suffering of God's people. I don't know how it happened. Different movies portray it differently. We don't know exactly how it happened. But we know something that happened to Moses. Living for 40 years in the palace, seeing the beauty, the majesty, seeing all of these things. He said, I want to broaden my horizon. I want to enlarge. I want to be objective. I don't want to just know the good and the pleasure. I also want to know how people live outside of these walls. And he came and he exposed himself to the suffering and the pain of people who were living in the same zip code. And when that happened, it messed him up. Because in the palace, when you're exposed to the palace, it breeds pride. When you're exposed to the pain, it creates perspective. And after you have a perspective, you can never look at the palace and the pleasure and the promotion and the money exactly the same way. Can somebody say amen? amen. When you are exposed to the pain, your life immediately gains a perspective. I remember when a few years ago when we were in Tanzania on a mission trip and I had the opportunity when I would say for the first time to be exposed to suffering. We grew up in Ukraine not very wealthy and Ukraine is, is not the greatest country but it's not the worst country. And I remember climbing up the mountain and some of you saw the video footage. I will never forget this for the rest of my life. When a woman who had no clothes except a blanket and she somehow wrapped the blanket around her in such a way that she was still able to fit the child like in a backpack style style on the back of the blanket and she walked up to lead us to show us how they eat and they've been eating for the past few weeks with a little stick no metal on the back on the underneath of the stick just a stick made out of just a sharp stones and that's it and as we went up to the mountain and we had all of that recorded she started to dig through the dirt to look for a root of a specific tree that only grows on the top of that mountain. As she found the root, with her bare hands she broke the root. With her bare hands she took the root out, no washing it in water because there is no water. Just blow it with the breath and starts to eat in the middle right in front of us. Gave it to her child on the back and this wasn't a show, this was lunch. And I remember standing there and boom something happened, an exposure happened. And when you have an exposure to pain, your perspective changes. You don't look at your shoes the same way. No wonder why guys went to the same trip with us and they went into the airport barefoot and gave all of their luggage and their shoes and their socks and went barefoot into the airport. Why? Perspective changed. And many people, they protect their heart from the pain of people and from the suffering of people because they're afraid it might damage their perspective and they'll find themselves like Moses. Not wanting to be a prince and not being good at being deliverer and finding themselves in the desert confused. Why? Because now I cannot enjoy the palace and I'm not sure what I should do about the pain. You're a mess. Why? Because you got exposed to the pain. That's why the Pharisees and the Levites, when they saw men in pain, they wanted to avoid that because it's a human tendency to avoid being exposed to suffering because you know it will mess with your perspective. Can somebody say amen? Some of you know the story of the Chandler's List, the movie who the won the best motion picture and, and the best director and all of these things when the, when the Polish Nazi man, he was trying to, had a very successful business during the time of uh, when Germans occupied a lot of the world and he was trying to protect the Jewish people from being slaughtered. He built a big factory and decided to hire all the people who were marked for being sent to concentra concentration, ca concentration camps. He started to hire them but where all of the story started was when he went to Germany and he saw a little girl wearing a red coat. I didn't watch the movie but I heard that they had that in footage in the movie as well. When he went to the plaza and he saw a little girl wearing a red coat and she just some, some, something happened to his heart when he saw her and he was really interested to see what's going to happen to her next. She was Jewish and next thing that he saw is wagons going and dead people on him and the girl with the red coat was on the top of that wagon and that's when everything shifted. A multi, multi-millionaire man decided to literally give all of his wealth away so he can save one man, one Jewish man. He started to bribe Nazis, bribe them with big money, diamonds. By the end of the time when the Germans, their empire fell, he became literally homeless 
because he gave all of his fortune to rescue Jewish people from being burned at the gas chambers. Why was his life, why did his life gain a perspective? Because of exposure to pain. And that's exactly what Moses had. Moses had an exposure to pleasure. It breeds pride. But there comes a point where you have exposure to pain and it breeds perspective. Some of you saw the interview that Bill Gates had on the Rolling Stone where he described his faith in God and how him and his wife they go to a Catholic church. But if you read Bill Gates' story, you will find out that Bill Gates gives more money and his nonprofit organization, charity organization that helps the poor is the largest and the most generous organization that the world has ever seen. There has never been somebody in the world who has the largest and so generous. He gives more money than all of us will be able to make in 25 lives put together. He gives that much money away. He doesn't have to do that. What happened to him? What caused him to give all of that wealth that he made and give it away so that people can have a second chance in life? Let me tell you what it was. Exposure to pain. He was exposed to people who were suffering. And this is something we must have as Christians, is we, you have to have exposure to the palace, but you must be like Moses. Once in a while you gotta step down from your palace, come down to where people are, meet people one-on-one, -on -one, get involved in people's lives and be exposed to how people actually are doing. I love our prayer lines, especially before prayer lines. Because see, the prayer lines here, what we see on Sunday is actually a drop in the bucket. It's what happens on Saturday when you meet the people and you see the baby that has a plug-in in her back, in her, in her head. That every few hours they have to take liquids out of the head and the baby cannot stand on its feet. See, we see the baby, mama holding the baby, but when you hear the story, something happens in your heart. See, God cannot give you a third exposure, which I'm going to give you, tell you right now, until we have the second exposure where we throw ourselves out and we say, God, I want my heart to be affected. I want my heart to be able to be touched with the infirmities and iniquities of people. Jesus was exposed to the needs of people. The Bible says he saw and he was moved with compassion. Jesus wasn't like a Pharisee and a Levite passing by. Jesus wasn't like Pharaoh who simply put everything on mute where they showed sufferings of people. Jesus was just like Moses. He went to his brethren and he let his heart be wrecked and be, he be touched and his perspective be renewed because of the pain he was exposed to. But the third exposure is the best. The first exposure is the exposure to the palace. Sometimes it breeds pride. The second exposure is the exposure to the pain. It produces perspective. But the third exposure, and this is the exposure that Moses has received on this mountain, is when you get exposed to the presence of God. The first exposure is the palace, the pain, and the presence of God. And Moses gets exposed to the presence of God. Moses gets exposed to who God is and something begins to happen right away to Moses is his life changes. He becomes a different man. He goes into Egypt, he changes a nation. A man that Jewish people remember today is not the man who was exposed to pain or exposed to the palace. A history and they're making just another movie in Hollywood right now about Moses and the reason why they're making it is not because Moses was exposed to pain. It's because 40 years later a man named Moses was exposed to another realm that is bigger than pain and bigger than the palace. It's called the presence of God. What really shifted everything in his life is not exposure to human suffering and human depravity and it's just the corruption of a human character and the pain and the difficulty and evil. What really changed everything in this story is a man got exposed to who God was. He wasn't the only one in the Bible who got exposed. There was many men in the Bible who got exposed to who God was. Zacchaeus was exposed and he was never the same. Jacob was exposed and he was never the same. Saul was exposed and he was never the same. When you get exposed to who God is, you will never be the same. Last year we had an opportunity to go to a vacation with my wife. This was the first time since we, um, since our honeymoon, we went to Mexico. Cancun, Mexico. And please don't judge me because even uh, some of us God sends to Mexico, Cancun and Mexico needs Jesus and Cancun needs Jesus. And so we went to uh, Cancun. Cancun is a very beautiful place. It's a very warm place and I made a one little mistake. During 
either our third or second day we went on the beach and the beach was right away walking from the hotel into the beach and the sun was really warm is really hot and we decided to tan for a little bit and my wife has these little uh, bottles that have certain um, lotion in them and I, I hate any no lotion on my body I think lotion is not masculine and I resist and repel any idea of lotion touching my body and so she said you need to put lotion because you're gonna get burned and I was like I'm not gonna get burned this is just gonna be three four minutes everything's gonna be fine I'll go back into the water well two three minutes uh, some of you know I have a gift of sleep and I can fall asleep anywhere and I can fall asleep easily what happened is I fell asleep and I fell asleep for about two hours or hour and a half and so um, in the Cancun Sun I woke up after that and and it felt really warm it felt really warm I touched my body it felt fire and so I was like man this is good this is good until we went back into the hotel and I was like a red tomato I looked at my body and I was like oh my goodness I am gonna die and for next three days I went through and I'm not exaggerating I went through hell my vacation turned into a nightmare because I couldn't sleep at night. Every part of my body literally hurt so bad. Then we went to some other little exploration thing. I had to stand, walk like this because I couldn't move any part of my body because I got exposed to the sun. And I refused to put lotion on. I've learned something that day that is very powerful. When you come to the sun without lotion, and without any cloth it will do its work but the moment you put lotion on or the moment you put something on it could block the rays of the sun and you will still remain like white like snow even though you laid under the sun no wonder God tells Moses remove your shoes God was telling Moses he says I want you to remove the lotion I want you to walk into my presence and I do not want you to have anything that will protect you from my rays. See God gives us his armor to protect us from demonic attacks but Satan gives us his veils to protect us from God's touch. The devil wants us to wear certain things in God's presence, to walk into God's presence, to walk into church where we have certain things on our hearts and sometimes they are like lotion. For people, some people it's unbelief, for some people it's pride and what it does is this, is God's presence comes but for it doesn't touch us. It doesn't turn white into red, it turns white into white and you come in and you leave the same not because God wasn't touching or God wasn't speaking but because you put on lotion that protects you even from God and we don't want to be that generation can somebody say amen we want to be we want to come to God forgive me for that analogy but completely vulnerable naked and exposed and say God here all I am I remove my shoes I remove my fear I remove my doubt I remove my unbelief I come the way I am and God whatever you want to do with my life I want you to do it with my life God touch me and consume and burn take a moment in this place to recognize God wants you to have an exposure of him God wants you to have an exposure of good things but God wants you also to have an exposure of people's pain and all of that is working for your good and when you walk into God's presence don't put anything on on the opposite make yourself completely available make yourself completely bare and when you come bare he will touch you at the point of your need can somebody say amen